and welcome back to the How To Be Good podcast. So today we're going to be talking with our guest about renewable energy. And it's not your wind or your solar, as, as so many have been. This time we're going to be talking more about wave power. We're talking to Ina Breverman, who founded Eco Wave Power in 2011 at just the age of 24. It's now a publicly listed company. And she was recognized as one of the 100 most influential individuals in the world by medium.com, uh, along with the likes of uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk. Indeed, and she, the way she started her life uh, and nearly lost it very early, uh, I think kind of um, formed the way she, uh, she works in business. Uh, she was born just two weeks before the Chernobyl uh, nuclear disaster and suffered the respiratory arrest. She was very close to dying. And she, she, I think she, she was she resuscitated, did, yeah. 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 And um, um, she, because she had the second um, chance to life, she devoted her entire life to uh, mitigating pollution. Absolutely. So it's a fantastic story that she's got. And mm. she's developed a fantastic product that has the potential to be one of the really big players in helping with... Um, environmental or what it, renewable power. Mm. And I think also um, in comparison to all the other wave power systems in the world, uh, this one is completely different, is not as uh, expensive and is not as fragile. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the chances of this um, being a success were, were quite high from the beginning and it, it's proven to be a really, really good option. Absolutely. So let's get on with it and hear from Ina Breverman from Eco Wave Power. Hello and welcome to the How To Be Good podcast. Today we are here with Ina Breverman, who is the founder and CEO of Eco Wave Power. How are you? Very well, thank you. And you? Very good. Thank you very much for joining us. So, could you take us on a little journey of what brought you to where you are now and how the first weeks of your life were very close to being your last? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. And uh, really, I think that my personal story has been an inspiration for me in uh, pursuing a, a career in wave energy. Uh, I live now in Israel, but I wasn't born in Israel. I was born in uh, Ukraine in uh, 90, 1986. And uh, two weeks after I was born, the Chernobyl nuclear reactor exploded, causing the largest in history nuclear disaster in terms of cost and casualties. And I was one of the babies that got hurt from the negative effects of the explosion. I actually had a respiratory arrest and a clinical death. My mother approached my crib and she saw me pale and blue and not breathing. And, uh, you know, she freaked out, she ran to my dad, like, oh my God, oh my God, my baby is dead, what do I do? And he shook her physically and said, like, you're a nurse, do something. And then she gave me a mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation until the ambulance came and basically saved my life. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got a second chance in life. And, uh, of course, I don't remember it, I was a baby. But, like, growing up, I kept hearing the story from my family, like, wow, like you got a second chance in life. And I really felt always like I should do something, you know, good with it. I should kind of give back because it's, you know, it's a special feeling. It's not something that happens to everybody. And uh, given the fact that kind of my first chance in life was taken away by not so safe way of uh, producing electricity, I think that uh, when I encountered the subject of wave energy, uh, which is a very huge source, but not really utilized in a commercial scale yet, it really made sense for me. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so have, is there any more lasting effects from, from the, the outbreak on you, or, or you're all fit and healthy and normal now? Except the tail. <laughs> <laughs> So listen, as, as far as I know, uh, not really, uh, but uh, I don't think that the effects 
risks of Chernobyl were fully really addressed or explored because back then the USSR didn't even want to notify the population that the explosion has happened. Actually, the first country that notified that there is a very bizarre radiation levels was Sweden. And, you know, it, it took time until the wind went that way. So I don't think that it was really explored, but there are a lot of uh, researchers that are associated with a big range of, you know, diseases and death, deaths that are happening around the region that are directly derived from Chernobyl. Like, for example, there's one study that showed that, that uh, during the explosion, 95% of the newborn babies in Belarus, which was on the border, which is on the border of Chernobyl, were born with different types of uh, heart problems, lung problems, cancer, and like had very significant issues. So I really think it was a huge explosion and like the effects are unknown, but for now I'm feeling well, which is the most important thing. Good. <laughs> Good. So could you tell us a little bit about Eco Wave Power and, and what you guys do as a team? Yes, so uh, our company developed a unique innovative technology for generation of clean electricity from ocean and sea waves. Uh, so we basically take this, as I said, huge resource that Mother Nature gave us for free that is not really used for anything other than maybe marine sports and uh, other you know, fun things in the ocean, and we turn it in really into a source of clean electricity. Fantastic. So for... For those of us that are not technically minded in that sense, could you give us a, an idea of, of how it works? Of course. So we attach floaters to existing structures such as piers, breakwaters, jetties and other types of uh, existing marine structures. Uh, these floaters are going up and down with the movement of the waves and they're pushing the hydro cylinders which transmits biodegradable fluid into land locator, land located accumulators. A pressure is being built in the accumulators. The higher the waves, the higher the pressure, which is used to turn the hydro motor, turn in a generator, and sending clean electricity to the grid via an inverter. The whole system is controlled by a smart automation system that basically enables a smooth supply of the electricity to the grid, and the system is equipped with a smart storm protection mechanism. So basically, when the waves are too high for the system to handle, the floaters automatically lift above the water level, and stay in the upward position until the storm passes. And when it passes, they commence operation. Very similar to wind turbines. When the wind actually blows too strong, the turbines lock down, locks down. Yeah. yeah, yeah, fantastic. So just one thing. So with with the the system, it sounds like it's reducing an awful lot of what perhaps traditionally would have been the mechanical sense of generating the power. It's it's a it's a much reduced system, so there are less points of failure. Uh, so the advantage in our system in comparison to like prevailing, uh, let's say, competing systems is mainly the fact that uh, they decided to install in the offshore, which is many kilometers into the ocean or the sea. And by doing that, uh, basically they had to put all their expensive equipment, all the generators and hydraulic conversion equipment inside the floater. And in the offshore, sometimes you have waves of 20 meters or even higher. And unfortunately, no man-made stationary equipment can survive the load of a 20 meter wave height. So then the generators and all the expensive equipment was inside. One big 20 meter wave, wave height and it's a total loss to the system. What we did differently is basically attaching to existing structures where the wave loads are lower, of course, than the offshore. In the onshore, we, we don't get 20 meters unless it's, of course, a tsunami, uh, which happens and that very rarely. Uh, and basically all our expensive equipment is located in a container, in a conversion unit on land, just like a regular power station. So even if something happens to the floater, although again, nothing would happen because you have the storm protection mechanism, all your expensive and sensitive equipment is protected on land. Mm -hmm. What uh, sets wave generated power apart from the solar and the wind power? They already have a strong foothold. First of all, it's important for me to say that like, I'm not objective and I'm a strong believer in wave energy, of course, but I do believe that in order to have a 100% uh, you know, environmentally friendly world for, for the next generation and to live our world uh, in a better shape than we got it maybe, uh, we need to utilize all renewable energy sources, wind, waves, solar, 
Each one of them is amazing in its own unique way, right? There's countries that are more sunny, like Israel. We have an amazing sun here. Uh, there's countries like Sweden, which don't have so much sun, but have maybe good wind. Like each country has an own its own dominating source. And some country, countries are lucky enough to have sun and wind and wave and everything together. But each one is occurring during, during usually different seasons or during different times every day. So then the systems are very complementary to each other. Let's say solar energy will not produce at night. But wave energy, there's no reason why not. So then you're creating much better stability and much larger electricity amounts. So wave energy is not here to compete with other renewable energy sources or to replace them. It's there as a complementary renewable energy source. Mm. Fantastic. So they actually work well together as a continuous source of energy. Exactly. It works well together. And, and another advantage of wave energy is also that uh, two-thirds of the world's population are currently living on the coastline. So with this type of population distribution, we can save a lot of transmission costs by giving you know, the energy directly from the ocean to the households. To the household, yeah. yeah. How much power could the eco-wave uh, power generate if, uh, um, given the capacity so, and the path to do so? So usually it's, it's not made specifically for one technology because, of course, the wave energy is made from many different uh, interesting technologies. Uh, but according to the World Energy Council uh, and the International Panel on Climate Change of the United Nations, uh, the, the actual number is they're saying that wave energy can generate twice the amount of electricity that the world produces now if you utilize all the good spaces around the world. If you're using uh, other studies, like for example, a study for Europe showing that by 2050, 10% uh, of, of Europe's electricity will be produced by uh, ocean energy. So there's different, uh, of course, studies, there's different numbers, but all of them are quite substantial and definitely shows, yeah. show us that wave energy is worth the attention. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so why, um, from the studies that you've read and so on, why do you think this is such an important option globally? For the global population so first of all of course because of the one the, the large amount of electricity as we said twice the amount of electricity that the world produces now that can be amazing and really push the world you know forward economically and regions that currently don't have access for electricity but have a big you know access to the oceans and to the seas it can really improve the lives of people second of all again as we said two-thirds of the world population are living on the coastline so with this population distri distribution, the need for wave energy is undeniable. Also, the fact that wave energy can generate electricity uh, sometimes more stable, stably than other renewable energy sources. So as we said, the, the solar is an amazing uh, resource, but the sun sets at night and you can't produce any electricity. In suitable locations, wave energy can produce 24-7 during the day, during the night, which gives much more stability. So it has a lot of advantages one of them also is that the density of water is about 800 times greater than the density of air, which means you can produce much larger electricity amounts with much less space, much smaller devices, which also means cheaper devices, less spaces. So like it has a lot of positive in it, which has you know yet to be fully explored. So we definitely yeah. need to utilize and explore it more. Fantastic. So one of the criticisms, I guess, of... of uh, wave power in the past would it, was that it was incredibly unreliable. And we've touched on that just briefly yeah. with the offshore side of things, things like that. So understanding how your system is different, how hard was it, though, to convince people to give wave power another try when you were first starting to push this out to people? Very hard. Because, you know, some usually when you make make up or develop or plan for a new technology or a new product, you start from, let's say, from zero. Nobody thinks anything not bad and not good about your technology or product, right? Like, it's new. They don't know about it. But when yeah. so many people tried or so many companies tried and failed and they failed, like, with very strong PR around it, <laughs> then you're not starting from zero. You're starting from minus 10 percent or minus 20 percent so then not only you have to explain your new product but now you have to always add an explanation how is it different from everything that they heard that failed so far you know yeah so uh, of course you know when you don't have um, 
a huge success story in the industry, it makes it harder to develop a new technology. But given the fact that our technology really significantly differentiates itself from what has been done before, I think it, it made our, you know, kind of convincing or explaining uh, easier. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the other, other criticisms uh, of other wave power systems in the past was its lack of insurability. How, how have you managed to overcome this? So the reason actually... First of all, insurance companies are happy to insure everything. Of course, that's how they're making revenues. The reason for a fee, that, <laughs> for a fee of course. <laughs> the reason that the insurance companies the struggle to insure, let's say, offshore wave energy specifically, is because they saw as well the high-profile failures. For example, there was a company called Pelamis that uh, the cost of its construction was very, very high in the millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, the development and construction, and it broke down, I think, after three days of operation on the coastline of Portugal. So total yeah. loss to the system. So when insurance companies saw that, like, it's so expensive and it breaks down every few days, like, it's not exactly a good business case if you have to pay the premium <laughs> every few days. Like, you didn't even collect yeah. the insurance yet. So I think that kind of maybe created, uh, that's my assumption, kind of created the fear among insurance companies saying like, okay, super expensive breakdown, like we don't want to deal with it. And the reason that I think that EcoWave Power uh, was able to get uh, really insurance is one, the cost is substantially lower. Our Gibraltar power station costs us only about $450,000 to build. It's very far away from the millions or hundreds of millions of other uh, companies. And second of all, really the reliability aspect, the fact that all your expensive equipment is on land, you would insure a house that is on the beach, you would insure like a port, uh, why wouldn't you, you would insure the actual breakwater on which the equipment sits on, why wouldn't you insure the equipment, like it just made it more, much more easy, and I think that, I don't think, I don't, want to to sound like I think that offshore energy, wave energy will never happen. I just think that the industry t tried to go too far too fast. For example, if you're looking into the wind industry, if you're researching a little bit, you see that the first 100 years, there was not one windmill that was built in the offshore. 100 years, yeah. all the windmill construction was only on land. Nobody dared before they had enough like financial resources and technical expertise. Nobody dared to go and put a windmill in the middle of the sea. The first one was in Denmark after 100 years. And wave energy right away, the first companies right away to the offshore. Extreme loads, new industry, not enough financial resources, not enough exper expertise. And that's, that's what kind of, I think, set the industry a little back, you know? Yeah, mm. absolutely. Now, I've, I've seen on your website um, a couple of pictures of the one on the old ammunition pier in Gibraltar. And it's yeah. it means a lot to me because I actually, my first job out of university was up on a hotel looking down at that same pier. So it's, really? a, it's a very, yeah, absolutely. So it's a nice image to, be able to see that. Yeah, so yeah, I, it was, um, and it's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, I guess it's, it's it's a strange part of the coast, and the cliff drops so so steeply from the top of yeah. the hotel. But it's I just remember looking out of that and thinking it's very different now. Looking with that with your wave power generators yeah. on it. <laughs> Listen, first of all, it's way cooler. Like yeah. instead of just being like a cement structure, and you know most environmentalists are not really happy with cement, bulky cement structures in the water. So we took something that you know, thank God we don't have any war anymore, so we don't need the ammunition jetting for ammunition. And uh, really, it wasn't used for anything. So we're taking this bulky, huge cement structure in the water that's not used for ever, anything and was neglected and turn it into a source of clean electricity. Plus, like, we opened it up for different uh, delegations. Like, we have in the second uh, week of uh, August, uh, like, Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts that are coming there uh, for a kind of uh, educational tour. We had visits from the European Union and the European Commission and, like, Different governments are coming there to see it because it's something that is rare. Like you don't see nowadays yeah. yet wave energy everywhere. So it's pretty cool. And plus like all our equipment is actually in, like the jetty is connected to the ammunition tunnel. They open inside yeah. the rock like a big 500 meters tunnel. So you yeah. drive like completely through the dark in this tunnel and then you go into the light and you see the floaters. So it's a pretty yeah. cool experience. Oh, it's fantastic. It, it brings back memories. I would love to go back there now and see the difference uh, that it was 
Oh, I'm trying to think 20 something years ago. Yeah, you're more than welcome to come. <laughs> one day, one day when we're allowed to travel. <laughs> so, looking at the, the, the way that it's set up, the, the capital expenditure for whether it's, it's governments or businesses or power companies mm -hmm. to, to undertake this system seems to be um, a lot less because you're utilizing existing structure. How have, how, have, how have these companies and governments reacted to it? So very positively, uh, because really I think that they see the benefit in the fact that we're not taking any prime real estate. You know, for example, many countries, they're limited in space, like Israel, like Gibraltar. They don't have a lot of land space. We can't put huge solar farms, unlimited solar farms. We can't put necessarily everywhere windmills because like, you will not put it in high uh, population density locations. But the breakwaters, again, you will not build a hotel on a breakwater. You will not use it for anything actually other than breaking the waves. So take, taking something that kind of damaged the environment and changed the ecological balance and turning it into a source of electricity, that's something that I think that governments really like. You know, it doesn't require a lot of efforts. It doesn't require a lot of land. So that, I think, is definitely a positive side. Another positive side is the fact that now, with the coronavirus, a lot of the governments have decided that they want to transition and exit from the you know, economical crisis, economic crisis that happened because of COVID-19, in a green way, in a clean way. And we're part of our strategy is producing all the heavy machineries, like the floaters, the arms, the civil engineering works, in the country of implementation. So then it, okay. it's also creating workplaces and a new industry. So that's also definitely an advantage. So I think it's a win-win solution. And that's why I think the response was very positive. Absolutely. So in, in uh, July, um, I think it was July 2019, you listed on uh, NASPAD's first north. And it was at the beginning of the, well, during the early wave of the pandemic. How was that received? And how nervous were you to start right at that critical yeah. point, really? So, indeed, we listed in July 2019 on uh, Nasdaq First North, Nasdaq Stockholm. Uh, we became the first Israeli company to ever list in Sweden. So, not only that uh, we had the pandemic, which was a new variable, but we also were the first Israeli company to decide to go to this market. So, it definitely was an enriching experience. <laughs> uh, we learned a lot. Um, since then, uh, in, uh, in, on the 1st of July, actually, we started also trading our shares on NASDAQ US. So we actually uplisted the company to NASDAQ US, which was a huge step for us, especially given that uh, most of the preparation works and all the roadshow we had to do through Zoom because nobody, nobody actually travels or makes like uh, investors meetings face to face. So definitely it, um, it was a bit of a unique experience. But I think it also taught us maybe that we can do business uh, differently than what we thought in the past. So, for example, you don't need to travel to, to see somebody necessarily to close a deal or to do something. You can also speak via Zoom and, by the way, save a lot of, uh, you know, pollution by not traveling as much. So I think maybe it has its positives, it has its negatives. And, you know, we need to really exit fully the pandemic and all its variables that are happening right now, the deltas and the, all the other things, and really see how the world, world like kind of adjusts itself in the day after. Yeah. Mm, exactly, yes. I think, uh, I think we, uh, we, we've been investing through the pandemics exa exactly through Zoom. Exactly. So, yeah. so, yeah. so uh, you can definitely do it, invest and, and look for investors and, and continue yeah. business as, uh, as usual. Absolutely. Um, and uh, where are you looking for projects uh, globally? Are you, do you have a, a set location to start um, uh, bringing, bringing the equipment and the systems um, over? How, how are you planning this? So basically we're interested in any location around the world that has a structure, uh, that has wave heights, that wave regimes that are suitable to our operation uh, modes. So we start operating 50 centimeters of wave height and higher. So that's uh, kind mm -hmm. of the minimum wave height that uh, we need. And of course, like the thing that is very important to us as well is that the country where we're developing a project, it preferably has policies that will enable us to implement. Because many times, uh, unfortunately, we see situations where ports or coastal municipalities are contacting us and saying, can we have a project? And we're like, yeah, we're super excited. Let's do a project. Which licenses do we need to submit? And then they go, we don't know. And they start 
the legislation process, oh, yeah. which does not happen within a day. So, of course, uh, yeah. it helps us if there is legislation in place in order to also develop our project. But really, we're focused in uh, Europe. We have a lot of our projects pipeline in Australia. Now that we entered also the U.S. market, we we're definitely interested to put something uh, in the U.S., like at least for a first step, a proof of concept in order to penetrate this huge, like, you know, market which has an in great like potential for us an enormous potential for us so like again we're talking to many many different countries around the world with the goal of uh, establishing policies when where, where there is not and where where there is like developing the actual project so um because we're in australia i'm going to ask where where are you uh, located in australia or are, where are you planning to bring bring your product so in Australia, actually, we received some funding from the government in order to open local offices, which are uh, in Brisbane. Um, the government, <laughs> the, government the other side. <laughs> yeah, the government of Queensland uh, actually supported us uh, with a grant uh, that was called Hot Desk, if I'm not wrong. And uh, Australia, again, of course, is very interesting. You have waves coming from all over, like you have great locations. We do. That's why. Australia uh, was leading for some time or had a lot of wave energy companies that were developing specifically there and still you have few, I think, wave energy companies uh, left. So definitely it's a it's very interesting market for us. And right now, uh, Matthias Sigal, who is part of our business development team, is responsible for the Australian market and is in conversations and, and negotiations with a number of uh, ports uh, in order to develop a project. And also we signed a collaboration agreement with Meridian, which is one of the energy companies in Australia, uh, to do a joint collaboration in the future with the project. Fantastic. I can think of so many places that we could put them on yeah. in, in here in Western <laughs> Australia. It would be ideal. But again, like you said, it's uh, policy first. <laughs> exactly. And too bad, you know, it's very kind of uh, uh, sad when the technology readiness is high, but the policy is not, did not catch up yet. Because like in the time that we're spending to kind of, you know, build the actual policy, we could have built the power station. So, like, exactly. I really hope that governments would take the next step in that regard and would set the policies, like, faster. Yeah. Mm. It yeah. would be good to see it across the world one day mm. and uh, and successful. So, uh, fingers crossed it will happen quickly. We will. I'm holding my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> so, as globally we're being uh, hit with more extreme um, weather events um, because of climate change, fires and floods and extreme heat, are you seeing um, a greater interest in uh, urgency from the governments to, to develop into green energy? I know that Europe and um, uh, Israel and a lot of countries around are really keen to actually develop their new economical um, uh, zone into green energy. But how about the rest of the world? Uh, are you seeing a, a nudge uh, for them to, to actually um, go, go for green energy rather than going back to their normal ways? I'm seeing a lot of goodwill. I'm seeing a lot of good intentions. I'm seeing a lot of positive campaigns and uh, different grants. Uh, that uh, are meant to support uh, more variety in renewable energy or more implementation. But in the same time, being objective, I also see that only 18%, one eight percent of the world's energy today is produced through renewable energy. So that's yeah. not enough. So not. we need, I think, to push a little bit harder. Like the COVID definitely put renewable energy high on the agenda because really a lot of governments have started the you know, talking more about renewable energy with relations to COVID, somehow these things came together. Yeah. But uh, I still think that, uh, you know, we can do a little better. Absolutely. Well, hopefully when when we have COP26 in November, it will that they'll push renewable energy that much further up the agenda now that there's yeah. more and more countries um, pushing hard. Um, and hopefully we get... Uh, more of a buy-in from the US now that we don't have Donald Trump being a problem and also maybe we can even get Australia to join in and do something half decent for a change mm -hmm. but um, yeah they need to they need to step up as well <laughs> yeah, I think everybody needs to step up and understand that in the end of the day it's a, it's a mutual goal 
Uh, I'm not saying like I'm not an extremist. I will not say in one day tomorrow go and close all the coal and oil and nuclear power stations because people will be left without a job and it will hurt the economy. So that's not realistic. But yes, we should slowly and safely make the transition, but not too slow. That's yeah, exactly. Thing. Exactly. So as a female entrepreneur and in what is predominantly a male dominated field, what struggles did you have to overcome to to get to where you are now? And this could be a whole podcast on its own, to be quite honest. <laughs> but, All but of the struggles. <laughs> <laughs> no, I always say that like being an entrepreneur, never mind a male or a female entrepreneur, is hard, right? Like mm -hmm. you have your ups, you have your down, like something different happens every day. Being a female entrepreneur adds a different an additional layer of difficulty, I think. Especially when you're like in the STEM sector, when you're in an energy sector, which is mostly like, you know, male dominated, it's a traditional sector with older men usually also. So like it's weird, it's strange for people or was strange for people to see a female lead in a company that is an energy company. So uh, I said many times, like, for example, when I was super excited, I was 24 when I opened the company and I went into conference rooms about to pitch my, you know, idea to all these men with the suit there. And I would come into the room about to start my presentation and then it would go coffee, please, water. People would make their reservations because if a woman came into the room, she's probably there as somebody's assistant. Um, you know, with the time and when the company gained more traction, I think like uh, things became more uh, appropriate. But still, like uh, I'll give you an example. In 2019, you brought up the IPO in Sweden. So after we did the IPO, uh, we looked for PR company because, you know, it's very standard when you're in a new market and nobody knows about you and the language is different. You want to create awareness about the share of the company, about the technology of the yeah. company. So we sat there in a room with like a big team with one of the largest uh, PR companies, let's say in Europe. And, uh, and like they gave us a presentation of what they can do for us and it was super impressive. And then when the presentation finished, there was a lady, which is one of the top heads of the company that stayed in the room and she said, uh, I can give you a great advice, like how to succeed. And I was like, you know, like I don't know the market, I don't know anything, I will take anything, give me any advice. And she goes, listen, what you need to do to be successful on the Swedish stock market is to step down, to quit, and hire an older man with white hair. That was her actual oh. advice. She said a woman doesn't show expert. Like, in an energy field, nobody will believe by, like, a woman as an expert. And I told her, you know, it's against everything I believe. Like, I'm all into, like, girl power, female entrepreneurship since I opened the company. So she goes, do you want to be right or you want to make money? Like, and she didn't mean anything bad. Yeah. But, like, this way of thinking made me think that, that if I would actually step down, you know, or another woman have been told to step down, then her daughter would step down and their daughter would step down and it will create a very negative chain of events that is very difficult to stop. So it's very important for me to say to any uh, woman that is listening to the podcast, do not step down, no matter what anybody says, unless you want to. If you want to, you can step down. <laughs> So can I, can I ask, did you hire the PR company? No. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So they stepped down. The end. They so stepped they down. stepped down. <laughs> yeah. Made them to step down. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> so recently, uh, you were chosen as one of the one hundred most influential individuals in the world by medium.com mm -hmm. um, along with the likes of Elon Musk and, and, and others, um, mm -hmm. Facebook guy, Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> <laughs> how did, how did that make you feel? Uh, first of all, it's a great honor. Uh, like, Again, I was born in a small town in Ukraine. I grew up in when we made like uh, when we immigrated from Ukraine to Israel. We immigrated to a super small town in Israel called Akko it's in the north of Israel, where we didn't even have like a cinema or a shopping mall, like anything that is considered standard was non-existent in the city. So most of the kids like were super bored and spend their time on the beach. So like you know, having that little girl like getting such recognition is like. It's very special. It's a very unique feeling, and it definitely was an unexpected uh, surprise. Absolutely. It's fantastic. What does uh, Eco Wake Power need to uh, continue its successful story? 
uh, awareness and which I think mm-hmm. that podcasts like yours are really helping to create because uh, being right. a new, <laughs> so thank you. So being a new renewable energy source, uh, we definitely need to create more knowledge, more awareness on, on different levels, the general population, the government, government level and so on. Two, we need more policies uh, as discussed uh, earlier in the conversation. I think that's the two main things that uh, are currently uh, missing a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So thinking more generally and understanding the climate emergency that we're in and the especially with all the devastation that's just happened recently across mm-hmm. the across the globe, what what keeps you up at night? Uh, Listen, my business is kind of my baby, so I'm really passionate about what I'm doing. Like, I wake up every morning super happy and super, like, motivated to go to to work. And I'm lucky enough also to have a very passionate team. that They really care what they're doing. And when you're sitting in an environment that, you know, the people around you uh, really care and are really motivated, and you're really motivated, and you feel like you're doing something good and not just, you know, another thing... I think that's on its own is enough to be really, really motivated. And what keeps me up is every time something else, you know, something in the engineering, something in the business development, <laughs> something with the legislation. <laughs> like you have a lot of thoughts, uh, you know, when you're running a new uh, industry or a new new kind of uh, technology company. Absolutely, absolutely. So switching it round, then, what mm-hmm. makes you optimistic for the future? So I think that, first of all, the positive shift that we're seeing in the world, like we said, maybe we don't, it's not enough yet, but, you know, the first step is to admit and the second step is to correct. So I think at least we're at the point of admitting, like everybody are kind of admitting that there is a problem. There's a problem, we need to fix it. We don't want our future generations to live in a dirty planet. Uh, We want something else. We want something different. COVID came and uh, showed us that when there's no, not so much airplanes and when there were lockdowns and they closed the factories, suddenly people could come and have a breath of fresh air or, uh, you know, the Venice tunnels for the first time were actually clean. And NASA made a picture of China where you can actually see the sky. So, like, I think um, people sh- saw what it can be when our, you know, planet is much cleaner and they want more of it. So that's what yes. makes me optimistic. Fantastic. If you were to ask our audience to change one thing to save our planet, what would that be? How can we be good? Anything. I'm flexible. (laughs) I think that each one should do whatever they can. Because, listen, one person has the ability to do one thing and another person has the ability to do another thing, right? So some people can contribute to the planet at least a little bit by putting the, the bottles in the right recycling bin instead of just throwing it in the general trash. Somebody can contribute by actually investing in a new technology. Somebody can invent a new technology, you know, like really work like researchers that really work on developing new technologies or different things that are making positive impact in the world. Each one has different abilities, capabilities, and things that he wants to do. Because in the end of the day, if there's no desire, then nobody will do anything. So really, I'm saying I'm flexible. Do something. If everybody in the world would do something small, the world would be much better place. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much for for joining us and being on the show. It's been an absolute delight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So that was Ina Breverman from EcoWave Power. And it kind of makes me feel like I haven't done enough with my life. <laughs> she started all that at 24. Exactly. And she's already listed on NASDAQ North and NASDAQ US. It's uh, It seems like a project and a product that is going to go very, very far and really genuinely help the planet in a big, big way. Mm, indeed, it's a really, really cool system and so easily mounted to every single existing structure. And as she explains through the interview, um, much cheaper than the other, the other mm. um, offshore 
solutions. Uh, a really, really good product. We're really looking forward to seeing it here in Australia. It'd be nice, be nice. Um, and around the world. Um, yes, we really enjoyed the interview. Please, uh, please go to our page to see the rest of the interviews that we have. And we'll put all the information about uh, EcoWave Power on our um, show notes and keep sharing and posting a lot of information that we've learned about EcoWave Power throughout the interview. Absolutely. And as always, we are a self-funded show. So if you'd like to help us out and spend a little bit of money to help us do it, then you can always go to our Patreon site, which is linked to our main site, which is on the show notes. And every little thing helps. Um, so it would be great. I think that's it. Oh, I've actually forgotten okay. to mention that we've added uh, Buy Me A Coffee. Option oh, right. on the website, so uh, is we it love really coffee. Is really going to be enough to keep you <laughs> in coffee, though? As long as we have coffee, we can do anything. <laughs> so uh, we've added that to our to our website as well. Um, as Gareth mentioned, we we are able to, able to do this because of your help. Please donate as much as you want, so we can keep uh, doing the work that we do. So what's the website then? Go on. www.howtobegood.com.au. <laughs> Excellent. Until next time, take care, stay safe. Bye. Bye.